Hey, folks, welcome back to the show. We have a great episode for you today. Um, we're going to help you to get fit in as little time as possible. But before we do that, a uh, couple of things. Number one, thank you, as always, for being here, for supporting the show. Uh, make sure that you check out my website, natnidham.com, because that's where you will find out about BSP, the private membership community that I host on Mighty Networks. Lots of fun in there. I do live Q&As. I invite... Um, I invite experts to come in and do Q&As for the group. We do end of one experiments. Uh, they get special deals on stuff. Lots and lots of fun stuff. So if you're interested in that, just go to natnidham.com and check out BSP community at the top. Secondly, you're going to want to sign up for my newsletter because you'll be the first to find out about my Black Friday shopping guide. And it's going to be amazing. So definitely do that. Head on over to natnidham.com and sign up for the newsletter and check out BSP. All right, let's talk a bit about our, our episode. Have you ever heard of about Rehit Fitness? In this episode of the Biohacking Superhuman Performance Podcast, our guest, Ulrich Dempfley, shares his quest to replicate this high-intensity, short-duration workout technique that requires just 24 minutes of, not your day, your week. Imagine that, 24 minutes a week. Ulrich shares the information about the nuanced science behind Rehit and the challenges that he faced in finding the right equipment. Turns out that to practice Rehit properly, you need very specialized equipment. As we navigate the world of Rehit, Ulrich reveals the surprising benefits of this workout routine. From increasing your VO2 max by 12%, which is comparable to a two-year boost in healthy life expense expectancy, to a whopping 62% reduction in your med Z score, a risk factor for metabolic diseases like type 2 diabetes, we get into the nuts and bolts of Rehit, discussing how it's less mentally draining and even physically draining than traditional workouts, accommodates your current fitness level, and is ideal for those dealing with high cortisol, chronically high cortisol, and adrenal fatigue, and frankly, even low cortisol. Ulrich Dempfley is the CEO and founder of the Carol Bike, a game-changing exercise equipment that offers efficient workouts in just a few minutes. In this episode, we discuss the psychological resistance to shorter workouts and how the Carol Bike overcomes this by delivering effective results in a very short time. Ulrich is also his background, and I, I would have guessed this, is that of an electrical engineer. So, once he found out about these types of workouts, he kind of decided he was going to crack this nut. Now, to get a Carol bike for yourself, if, you, if you're really inspired at the end of this episode, visit carolbike.com and use promo code NAT for, for $100 off. All right, let's jump into this episode. Hey folks, just a quick reminder that all of the information presented in this podcast is for information purposes only. No medical advice, no diagnosing, no treatments suggested here. Before you try anything that you hear about or learn about here, make sure that you check with your medical provider. Welcome back, everybody. Uh, today, we have a great guest, um, Ulrich Dempfler. Welcome to the show. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Oh, it's my pleasure. We met... I think the first time we met was probably six years ago. At 2019, wasn't it? Something. Oh, maybe. So then only five years ago, something like that. It was at Paleo FX. You had In a Austin. tiny little space at the back, back, back of the show. And I remember coming <laughs> by and you put me on this bike and had me pedal my heart out for the two short little periods of time. Totally blew my mind. As a matter of fact, that video is probably still on my Instagram feed if you go back long mm -hmm. far enough. Awesome. Yeah, I remember it very vividly. I remember it very vividly. Yeah, no, it was, um, it was, it was definitely. I was obsessed from that day. As a matter of fact, I went. Out, I eventually it took me about a year or so, but I finally bought a bike. But um, in the meantime, it's been a long time, and mm -hmm. we're going to talk about all things um, about rehit fitness, the role that certain types of fitness play in helping people to overcome metabolic disorders. And maybe bust a few myths about that mm -hmm. people may think about exercise and fitness and what it really takes to move the needle for people in a meaningful way. Um, so let's get started with you. 
how did you come into this space? Like, what's your what's your fascination? Are you for the engineer side or the health side? Or <laughs> I mean, first, I I came to this by accident, absolutely. So I'm by background a mechanical engineer, um, and I used to work for automotive industry. So I'm German, and I used to work for all the big German car brands. But then, um, uh, through life circumstances, I changed into healthcare, and for many many years worked in healthcare. Um, with hospitals, with health insurance companies, health plans, um, and actually worked on operational efficiency in health services. And the most uh, effective, powerful thing you can do to to reduce healthcare cost and health burden or the the burden of ill health Mm -hmm. is prevention. And so we, um, my co-founders and I, we designed and ran chronic disease management programs. So programs for people with diabetes, heart disease, and so on. Um, And one of the most powerful interventions for for that group of people, and for everybody really, is exercise. So beyond any doubt, one of the best things you can do, maybe after sleep, is exercise. I think there's, there's very little doubt about that. The problem is just that very, very few people actually do exercise and work out enough um, and we experienced that as well. And as we struggled with this problem, we came across um, a new form of exercise uh, called reduced exertion, high intensity interval training. Um, so we saw a, a show on the BBC where they showcased the science of rehit. Mm. And we fell in love instantly overnight. Um, I went out, so I saw it, paid careful attention how it's done. And the very next day, I went to a fitness equipment store and bought myself a a, a regular exercise bike that I thought um, would be best suited to do rehit. Okay. So let's define rehit exactly to people what that is and how it's different from hit. Just if yes, if sure, I can interject sure. there before we carry on, just so people know what we're talking about. Yeah. So most people will be um, familiar with HIT, high intensity interval training. And the effectiveness of HIT is beyond any doubt. Mm-hmm. Um, the issue with HIT is that um, many people find it pretty hard. So the, the rate of perceived exertion is fairly high. And it's also not that time efficient because you tend to do, and there's a great uh, var- variability four, five, six, eight intervals that are 30, 40, 60 seconds. And so by the time you're done, um, you're definitely sweat drenched and uh, you've spent 30, 20 to 30 minutes in, in a regular hit session. Um, and so scientists went out to find um, what is the most effective and shortest form of hit mm-hmm. and basically titrated back, like how little do you have to do to still get the benefits. And that led to rehit, so reduced exertion high intensity interval training, which is basically a workout that has only two 20 second sprints with a very gentle warm up, recovery, and cool down. In those 20 second sprints, you go all out. So they're maximum intensity, but it's only two 20 second sprints. And the entire workout can be done in as little as five minutes. And Numerous studies have not shown that is is a very is is like the most effective form of cardio exercise, um, and that you can in fact get like very substantial health and fitness benefits in this incredibly short amount of time. And you know you hear that and it's it's amazing. And as I said, we fell in love, I fell in love with it overnight. And I tried to do it. And I just wanted to do this for myself. Yeah. yeah. So you went out and bought a bike and <laughs> taking you but back to just, the original it story. Just, <laughs> it just didn't work. I couldn't replicate it. It was nothing like what they had demonstrated on the BBC. So it wasn't easy. It wasn't quick. It was like sweated like hell. Um, and, and so instead of just giving up and putting the bike away, we called the scientists and asked like, what are we doing wrong? And and I remember very well talking with, with Dr. Niels Vollard. And the very first thing he said was, well, you need a special bike. And I was like, well, but you didn't mention that. <laughs> Why didn't you say? Um, so in, in their labs, they used um, 
special equipment that um, is operated by a second person, by a lab technician, and that applies like a precise resistance at um, exactly the right time, um, very rapidly. And the, the, the person who does the workout um, accelerates to a high pedal cadence before the resistance gets applied, then the resistance gets applied. And um, that's the way you reach your, your maximum power, your maximum intensity. And if you, if you have this um, precise setup, it is actually, so it lives up to the promise of what was shown on that BBC program. And it is a, a fairly doable, um, obviously it's not easy, but it's really quick and really effective. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and there was simply no consumer friendly equipment available at the time. And, but we wanted to do it. <laughs> and so we decided to, well, why can't we develop a bike that takes the exact same protocols and setup in the lab and brings it to consumers. And the, the result is a computer controlled bike with, with some AI algorithms that optimize the resistance and control the workout for you. So then it's very simple to perform and it's suitable for any age of fitness level because we, we can personalize it so much. Mm -hmm but basically takes all the complicated bits out and makes it as simple as possible to perform this highly efficient rehit workout. Yeah. And yeah, so that's, that's like 10 years ago now. And it, it was really not uh, an easy journey to, to get from there to, to where we're now. Um, but I think, so I'm, I'm very happy with our product now and, and think uh, it, it works beautifully and has it actually achieved to take, um, very promising, brilliant science out of the lab and translating it into like real world benefits for for every for 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 almost yeah for everybody really. Well, and in and in so let's talk a little bit about the research and the the, the mm -hmm. health benefits of this type of training because I think that that's where and and the population that it helps right because I think what's really interesting about this type of exercise is that it becomes a, it these benefits become accessible to a population that to your, you and you mentioned it earlier not only are they not people who exercise but they find exercise really hard like these are not people who can easily get up and go out for a 30 minute run or you know or or go swimming for an hour or like these are people who you know for any number of reasons have become so sedentary that doing a lot of exercise is not only intimidating mm. but it's physically almost impossible yeah, for them yeah. to do it so so that's right that's right even though i i have to say and we've learned a lot about uh, our users um as we you know built our our user base and customer base um we we thought initially when we developed the bike that yes this would be an answer for people who struggle to do regular workouts who maybe don't like exercise um and uh, certainly who are time starved um, and, and don't have time for exercise. Uh, what we've learned over time is that actually our, our user base is hugely diverse. So oh, yeah. we We're have dig into that. <laughs> um, we, we have plenty of people who, who um, love exercise and who exercise a lot. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And we have, we have ex, uh, no, actually you will never become an ex, you're like Olympic gold medalists, uh, pro athletes. So we have, we have people um, yes, that who, who lead sedentary lifestyles or have led sedentary lifestyles and who struggle to exercise, uh, either because they're too busy or they found it hard to do traditional exercise. But we very much have also people who, whoa, exercise a lot and are in great shape and just want this, um, you know, want an additional tool in their toolbox to, to reach optimal performance. So it's, it's not just for people who, don't have time for exercise or who don't like exercise. There's mm -hmm. really, it's it's a broad spectrum of people who who use our bikes. For sure. I mean, listen, I introduced my chiropractor to the bike and mm -hmm. he's a fit guy. So, but he's become obsessed because there's a leaderboard and he's obsessed about his position on the leaderboard, mm -hmm. but awesome. which is, a, which I mean, the smile on your face is all I need to see. But on top of that, because he's a competitive dude and he's got competitive friends and he used to you know, be always mm -hmm. fighting with my husband on the leaderboard. But 
the last time I saw him, he was telling me that his 17 year old son, who's a competitive hockey player, yeah, gets on yeah. the bike three times a week and notices that his performance mm-hmm. on the ice is materially impacted by yeah. the training awesome. that he does on the bike. But but let's but before we go so, to so that is yeah. that is so good to hear. Yeah. One thing um, that I think about like talking about who uses our bike. And if I look at about our customers, so typically we, we don't, so we, we have the 17 year olds and actually my, my 14 year old boys use the bike. Um, but most people who purchase a bike are tend to be like 35, like 35 to 65. We have younger customers and definitely younger users. Yeah. But I think most people who, who purchase a bike like ours and who want to do rehit um, and, and have this emphasize on effectiveness, um, are a little bit older when the key focus of exercise is not anymore that I want to look ripped and I want to look great uh, on the beach. I want to live. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But you actually um, approach exercise and working out with some specific like health and fitness goals and well-being goals um, that you want to achieve. And uh, that I, I think there is something around 40. Certainly for me, that was the moment that where, where the attitude towards b- before I did sports, but more for like fun and competitive reasons. Mm-hmm. Um, since 40, I, I have like functional objectives for sports. Like I want to stay fit and I want to stay strong. Those, those types of things and healthy and, and for longevity benefits. And that, that is, I think, a slightly different approach to as to why you purchase or why, why you engage in, in, in workouts, whether, whether there's like a functional, or, or more like an entertainment or, or, you know, like appearance aspect to it. A hundred percent. So let's talk a little bit about that research though. Let's go back to, mm-hmm. um, you know, cause with the first research, the research that caught your attention, I think spoke to a particular population and how like the health metrics, the, mm-hmm. the Delta in people's health from the time they sit. And I think it took a couple of months maybe um, from starting this type of workout to a couple of months out were, they're really impressive because yeah, yeah. we're not talking people who were, nobody told them to change much. I don't think they were coached to change anything else in their life. Yeah. So and the intervention somehow, was exercise. Yes. Yeah. The In, in this case, X was exercise. Mm-hmm. It wasn't yeah. anything else. And so maybe let's talk a little bit about that research because it is really impressive research. Sure. Sure. So, um, and there's, uh, so, so I can introduce first some research really done on, our bikes, um, so where Carol bike was compared in a randomized control trial against um, government guidelines, five times a week, half an hour jogging. So um, they had two groups randomly allocated, um, and the, there was the rehit group that did three times a week, this very short workout. So at the time it was eight minutes, 40 seconds, but only two 20 second sprints. Mm-hmm. So they spent 26 minutes per week. And the other group, um, did uh, one two and a half hours, five times thirty minutes of jogging per week, and so the um, key outcomes that they've uh, tracked for and controlled were like cardiorespiratory fitness (VO2 max) mm-hmm. on the one hand, and then metabolic health uh, on the other side. Um, and metabolic health, uh, they, they tracked a, a basket of indicators, and then that gets aggregated to a score called the MED-Z score. And the, the results were really, um, yeah, very impressive, as you said. So for VO2 max, in only eight weeks, people saw an improvement in the rehit group of 12.3%. And so I don't know how familiar your listeners will be. I assume they will be somewhat familiar with VO2 max. VO2 max is probably the most important health metrics metric. It's the strongest correlate to um, life expectancy and a 12% improvement in such a fundamental physiological marker is uh, very impressive. Mm-hmm. And, um, and in, eight weeks. Talk, <laughs> in eight weeks, in yes, very short exactly. Of time. So, so, so you, you can make a very substantial difference in, in a very short amount of time and with a very short amount of time, exactly. Mm-hmm. So can you explain what VO2 max is to the Absolutely. audience? Just because I think people hear these terms a lot yeah. and sometimes aren't exactly familiar with what, what it means. And yeah. and yeah. how would you maybe 
how would it change your life? Like, how would you of feel course. it in your day-to-day mm-hmm. world? Yes, yes, yes. So VO2 max is your maximum ability to burn, to metabolize oxygen during exercise. Um, and the the rate limiting factors for that is on the one hand, um, how how much oxygen can you deliver to your muscles? Um, and that's that's your cardiac um uh, cardiac flow and your, your peak cardiac output, Right. that's that's oxygen delivery. And then the other uh, limiting factor is oxygen consumption that is in your mitochondria, in your muscles, how much oxygen can you literally burn um, as, you, as you exercise? And um, as you, with rehit, you can improve this by 12% in only eight weeks. Um, and the, like, to put it into context, a, a 10% uh, improvement in VO2 max has been shown to, to be equivalent to a, a two-year increase in healthy life expectancy. Wow. So it's very substantial. Yeah. And then the other thing in terms of how it feels, as we age from, from around the age of 30, we lose on average about 10% of VO2 max per decade. So that means... If you think back, how you, yeah. you know, how easy it was for you to to walk upstairs to to engage in exercise um, ten years ago, then that is what you can basically gain back more than gain back in only eight weeks. So it's it's a very it's it's not subtle at all. No. So um, if you do that, the the almost cliche feedback we get is like I'm flying up the stairs now. Mm-hmm. Um, and and people, so it's very noticeable if you if you have that level of improvement in your cardiorespiratory fitness, yeah. and also quick enough for it to. So so on the bike you have a lot of um, metrics and it's all very quantified and you can track your progress. Great, you have a leaderboard and you can compete and so on. But in terms of how you feel, that you 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 wouldn't even need all those metrics because it's so obvious, um, and. That really sets it apart from, say, I, I, I do a bunch of other biohacking things and this and that. As yeah, we and, all and do, yes. I, I, I change <laughs> every few months my 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 stack and program a little bit, and many things I do on faith really, and um, mm-hmm. uh, it's it's fairly hard for me to tell. Um, does it actually make a difference? Like you, you won't have that problem with with this type of exercise. Like it's very noticeable. And you will feel the difference. A hundred percent. So uh, I love that. So that's VO2 max, but you, you've one of the, some of the things that really caught my attention also in the research was the metabolic health, the mm-hmm. things that people won't necessarily feel, but that their doctors yeah. look at when they go to the, for a checkup. Right. Yeah, so, yeah exactly. And maybe can so, you talk a little bit about some of the things in that bucket that people would are yeah. most concerned with. Yeah, sure. Sure. So, um, the the aggregate score is this METS Z score that expresses your risk of developing metabolic diseases like type two diabetes. And what goes into that is um, five five measurements: is blood pressure, um, HDL cholesterol, so that's the the good cholesterol, mm-hmm. um, triglyceride, mm-hmm. blood sugar, and waist circumference, and so over that eight week trial period, our intervention group with the rehit saw a reduction in that med Z score of sixty two percent, which is that's remarkable. Huge. Yeah, in eight that's weeks? I think, in eight weeks. I don't think yes. you could find a diet that does it that in eight weeks. <laughs> I don't know whether you can find a diet that does that. Um, so the equivalent that that our researchers told us. Um, would be metformin. So that would be the level of risk reduction that you could expect from taking a drug like metformin, but without the side effects, because metformin is not unequivocally a good thing. It has uh, it has side effects, it has undesired effects, and it's actually quite debated whether whether it's a mm-hmm. good thing to, to, to take it or not, um, because it inhibits other important processes in your body, whereas exercise doesn't. It makes you stronger. And so um, the, the gain in metabolic health 
is, is yes, yeah, very remarkable and desperately needed because if you look across the population in, in the US, it's, um, yeah, sadly, uh, there's, a, there's a majority of people who are metabolically, like it's a minority of people that are metabolically healthy. And, and yeah. many people, like a majority is not and is on the verge and, and on a trajectory to, to get diabetes eventually, mm -hmm. which, is, which is then and many bad knock-on effects. Yeah, no, and waist circumference is another metric that is telling about all of mm. these things. So, um, what was I? What was I going to go next? I think that, I mean, the 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 fact that in eight weeks, what was it? Eight twenty four minutes a week, which flies in defiance of every of every government, you know. Mm fitness kind of goals you need to be aiming for 30 minutes a day um of and and it doesn't mean just to be clear i mean it doesn't mean you should just sit around for mm -hmm. all the other minutes of the, all the days of the week other than these these three little islands of time but but it makes it if you can imagine that this is it's in these 8 minutes three times a week you're yeah. going to move the needle and then you can spend whatever other time just doing something you love whether it's yeah, dancing yeah. or yes, or yes, playing yes. tennis or or whatever i mean Absolutely. going for a walk on the beach or in the forest mm -hmm. or on the street it's it allows you so, the freedom to just do other stuff absolutely absolutely so you save a lot of time and so we uh, are absolutely clear exercise is good and positive and we we don't poo poo other forms of exercise yeah. if you uh, if you enjoy walking, hiking, running, dancing, that's fantastic. Do that. Keep doing it. It's it will be good for you. Um, also, like in multiple ways for your mental health, for your physical health, and so on. So exercise is great, and we will never advocate to do less. However, there are many people who um, who don't do any exercise. I think mm -hmm. in the the latest statistics I've seen is if, if you apply rigorous criteria, it's 5% of the American population that does sufficient, uh, that gets f sufficient physical activity. So it's, it's shockingly low and, yeah. and, and inactivity is, is amongst the biggest killer. So, mm -hmm. so, so it's, mm -hmm. um, there, there are studies that have shown that physical inactivity kills more people or, or causes more excess deaths than smoking, diabetes, and obesity combined, combined. So it's yeah. it's really, it's a big thing. And so if you struggle, this is the highest ROI, mm -hmm. the highest return on investment activity that you could do. So, um, and many of our users, I think, see it that way, that that's, that's kind of their base. They cover their base. And then yes, they do additional things on top, and you can do other things on the bike. Like actually, you can do many other things on the bike on top if you want to go above and beyond. But this is a very, very time efficient strategy to cover your base and to get um, a lot of health and fitness benefits in very, very little time. Yeah, I yeah, no, that's that's perfect. Um, and the other thing I wanted to mention, and I mean, and I think this is if we if this is one end of the spectrum, right? So we now are at the minimum effective dose. And mm -hmm. quite frankly, most people are looking for the minimum effective dose. There's what's the least I could do to get the most amount yeah. of benefit. Like it's a little bit like chasing the silver bullet. And this is kind of not quite a silver bullet, but it's definitely what, where's that intersection of efficiency going yeah. to be. And at the end of the end of the spectrum, you have people who, and I'm not, judging at all, but people who spend two hours a day exercising, whether it's running mm. or at the gym, and there's there's a dark side to that, right? I mean, I think that certainly there's people that love it and this is what they do and they and it works for them. But I think that for those of us in the space of longevity per se, yeah. mm. marathon runners are not the most long lived people on the planet. Like they're yeah. they're wearing out their parts in many ways. They're yeah. they're kicking the stuffing out of their bodies and they're not doing it for longevity purposes. They're doing it for the no, love of running, they're doing, they're doing it, it for the performance, endorphins, yes, for exactly. the performance, for the sport. So obviously, but but for someone who's really honing in on, I want to live the longest, healthiest life possible, 
taking up marathon running probably isn't going to be the mm. thing that's going to get you there because to begin with, you're probably going to end up needing more, more parts along the way. You're going to wear out your knees or your hips or whatever the case may be. And, and, and I know it's linked to inflammation and, you know, all of these mm -hmm. things are very complex. I'm, I'm simplifying it a little bit, but I think the idea that, that we've all been told no pain, no gain, you got to put in the work, you got to put in the hours. There's, there's something to, wow, like I could do this little and move mm -hmm. this metric. And then like, I mean, for me, I do the bike. I also work, lift very heavy weights twice a week mm. because as wonderful as the bike is, it's not going to help me to build yeah, bones, yeah, right? Exactly, and so exactly. I and and that workout also, it's thirty minutes. Mm. It's really unpleasant for thirty mm. minutes, <laughs> and then I'm done, right? <laughs> yeah, I, awesome. It's it's um, but it's so you know I have that psychology of where am I going to find the most efficiency, and then it allows me to do other things, yeah. kind of thing. But I think this idea of not wearing out your your body with very long workouts. And to your point, if you're really attached to those long workouts, you can do them on the bike. It's not a problem. Yeah. The bike does not cut you off by any stretch. Um, but And we can talk about the fat burner workout in a minute because I think that one is exceptionally interesting to talk about. Uh, mm -hmm. or to Everybody needs to experience it at least once, have their butts kicked by an eight-second sprint. <laughs> But um, but the but the notion that we could um, we could be maybe healthier by doing a little bit less, yeah. and and for people who have issues with with cortisol and with adrenal fatigue, like their systems can't handle, their nervous system literally can't handle the big long workouts. Yeah, this yeah. again offers a different kind of option. Yeah, exactly, and I I think it is time to. You, you you mentioned silver bullet and magic bullet. It's certainly so. It's super time efficient and super effective. Um, it's not a free lunch per se. So um, the two twenty second sprints are performed at maximum intensity, and the bike helps you to do that. And it makes it really simple. Coaches you through the workout, applies the resistance automatically at the optimal level, at the optimal time, and so on. But you have to push really hard. You have to push to your limit. And that is obviously, um, so once you've done it, you will understand why it works, why it's so effective. So, so those two 20 second sprints are, are fairly hard. Um, but the, the psychology of two 20 second sprints, I think is quite interesting because, mm -hmm. um, and I, so my, my perception of it, and I, I do this a lot and I think I'm, I tend to think I've done this more than anybody else. Uh, I've, I've looked through my various accounts and data. I've done this like 1,200, 1,300 rides by now. I don't wow. think there will be many others who who have that um, level of experience with rehead rides. Is that the pain, and there's a little bit of pain. So, so kind of totally. the, the saying, no pain, no gain is yeah, no, still holds a bit true pain. a little bit. It just doesn't the, last long. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So the pain for me kicks in after about 15 seconds of the sprint. And so then the last five seconds, I really have to push hard and, and kind of exert willpower. Um, but then after five seconds, it's also the sprint is over already. And I do another one and then I'm, I'm done with my workout. Um, as you do, I, I, I love, actually, I really enjoy weightlifting. I, I, I love uh, powerlifting and I, I take great pride in my deadlift and so on. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, so, and, and I do other things. So I, I do most weekends also 5k run because, because I can, I would have to wait uh, uh, rather than watching the football, I run around it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but a 5k run for me is, um, psychologically much harder then one of those rehead rides because um, to get any sensible performance or uh, just have a good run, I have to push myself every single step, every single step for like 20, 25 minutes. And I find that psychologically much harder. Or, or if I go to the gym for, to, to, for, for weightlifting, I have to push myself close to failure on every single set. So again, the, the psychological drain 
And mm -hmm. the, the psychological energy that I have to exert is actually much higher than in a rehanded workout where I only have to push these two 20 second sprints through. And the, the pain basically only uh, emerges as I'm almost finished with it. So it's, it's definitely not a free lunch. It's definitely hard to, like the sprints are hard, but you get through it quite easily. And it's, it's a quite doable thing. Yeah. Well, I know one thing I want to stress for anybody who's never heard of this bike before, never been on one, it's quite unique. And, and Ulrich um, spoke about it earlier, but I want to reinforce the fact that when you're doing your sprint, it's not just you pedaling as fast as you can. The bike is going to set up resistance to your pedaling based on your own strength. So the bike mm -hmm. gets trained to basically push against you as hard as it needs to, to make it as hard for you as you can manage and still allow you to push that hard. And so 20 seconds will never seem quite so long as when you're doing one of these rehead sets, because, you know, you, for you, it kicks in at 15 seconds. For me, I haven't done as many rides as you. So at about 10 seconds, I look up and I'm like, holy jumping, I got another 10 seconds to go. I'm only uh -huh. halfway and it feels like it's forever. And it's really only 10 seconds, right? Yeah. So yeah, that's it is. Right. That's right. But it's important to mention that I think that this this bike, the AI, the mm -hmm. algorithm on the bike trains to push against you and it will evolve as you get stronger. So exactly. the good news is that it evolves as you get stronger. The bad news is it never actually gets any easier. <laughs> no, it does get easier. So if you if you um, psychologically, it does because you okay. get used to it. Yes, yes, that's right. That's right. And so, yeah, exactly. The bike keeps optimizing and personalizing the workout for you as you get fitter and stronger. The, the reverse is actually also true. If you, if you had an injury or, mm -hmm. um, you, you, I don't know, it happens. Yeah. You, you, for some reason, you were day. traveling and so on. Yeah. Um, you fell kind of, you, 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 you fail to do your workouts for, for a period. Um, it will also ease off uh, again and adjust to your current fitness level. And, and that's quite important why, um, you know, there's other bikes. There's like these air bikes that the CrossFit community uses. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. These um, old bikes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. And uh, they're, they're, they're good bikes, but they're um, in a way much simpler because they have like a single gear and they're, they're not personalized. Um, and the, 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 how how much force is exerted at what uh, cadence is just one curve. And it might be perfect for a 30-year-old CrossFit athlete. Mm -hmm. It certainly wouldn't be perfect for my mom, who's, who's 80 by now, but who still uses the Carol bike for religiously every other day. Mm -hmm. um, and she can because, and, and she's, she's at the bottom of the leaderboard most of the time. But it's she's okay. On the leaderboard. Yeah, exactly. She's exactly. on the bike. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly that. And and one other thing, maybe also just to mention, because um, so this is something we've um, done quite recently, um, and we, we're really chuffed by the results that we're seeing, and and also the feedback we're getting. So um, the the original rehit workout is two 20 second sprints, and then you can also do workouts with two 15 second sprints or two 10 second sprints, which are a lot easier. Mm -hmm. And some time ago, earlier this year, we've introduced options with three 15 second sprints, which um, uh, give a total of 45 seconds sprinting um, and lead actually to the same level of um, peak heart rate. So same level of physiological stress, but the perception of how hard it, how easy it feels is, is better than two 20 second sprints. So you, um, so there are options on the bike. If two, so two 20 second sprints is a go-to workout has the most scientific research and we're sure this works best for most people. But if it's too hard for you, there are options to have a slightly more tolerable, easier kind of sprint workout, rehead workout, and to, to just make it feasible and easy to develop a, a sustainable habit. Because mm -hmm. so exercise, exercise is wonderful. So many fantastic benefits. The only downside is you actually have to do it to <laughs> maintain those benefits. And, and here exercise is a bit like um, 
like a diet. Yeah, you can um, uh, get a lot of benefits in really short time, like lose a lot of weight or gain a lot of fitness. But once you stop, the detraining effect is actually also quite rapid, and you you lose the gains about as fast as you got them. Mm-hmm. Um, and that means if you stop exercising, yeah, you, you'll you'll revert back to to where you were before. So you have to find something that works for you and that works for you on an ongoing basis. Come mm-hmm. sunshine or rain, you, you're able to do it. You have the time to do it and you, you, you have the, the willpower and you can, you can just stick to it. And with those other options, um, we, we try to emphasize on that and really give everybody an option to find a workout that they can stick to, because that's, that's really the, the holy grail of, Yep. of exercise is just finding something that works for you and that you can do. Um, and the feedback we've got from our users is very positive, very encouraging um, for those new workout options to make it, um, you know, a slight variation, slightly shorter sprints, um, but yeah, more doable for for some of our users. Well, and it's a way of building up, right? I mean, at some exactly level, that. you're yes. meeting people mm-hmm. where they are, right? So the person who starts with the two 10-second sprints eventually yeah. is probably going to graduate to two 15-second sprints. Absolutely. They might want to, you know, you, you're giving people options. Mm-hmm. For, when I first got my bike, it was two 20-second sprints, and that was pretty much it. And then there was the infamous fat burner workout, which we'll talk about in a minute. But, but mm-hmm. I also want to talk about mechanistically how this workout works in the body like one of the yeah. one of the really interesting things that happens is this idea of glycogen depletion yeah in yeah. the biggest muscles in your in your body like in your quads and 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 that ultimately is what leads to better glucose disposal better insulin sensitivity over time like i think you know sometimes we tell people oh your blood pressure is going to get better your waist circumference is going to go down your cholesterol and your triglycerides are going to improve in your blood sugar and they're like how how is me pedaling Mm -hmm. going to affect any of those things and yeah i just think maybe because you know it's exciting to talk about how the bike works and who uses it and how they use it but i think if we could go back yeah, for one sure. second to mechanistically how it's providing those benefits. We talked about the VO2 max, and that's ultimately by pushing the mm. system to its extreme for a very mm. short period of time so that it becomes a hormetic stressor instead of a chronic stressor that could be less beneficial. But this yeah. idea of glycogen depletion, I think, is something that's important for mm. people to also understand. Yeah, of course, of course. So. The, the and it's entirely natural and this i think one of the questions we get most like how how can this be possible why would you get such great benefits in so little time and the reason is just it's a different adaptation pathway um than other uh aerobic exercises use so in those rehit sprints these two 20 second sprints create a very significant energy uh, spike in energy demand so the energy demand goes up by a factor of 100 of 100 compared to rest so because of the rapid onset of the intensity and the basically from you go from zero to max in a split second you cannot use energy from your normal aerobic uh, energy system and instead have to use locally available energy sources and there's um two systems. So the first is is the phosphocreatine system that switches on instantly, basically, but lasts only for about 10 seconds. So that's the the first thing you burn through. And then the next thing you use is um, muscular glycogen. And glycogen is a storage form of sugar that's stored locally in the muscle. Um, And that's also very, very rapid um, and, and basically kicks in as soon as the phosphocreatine um, system is depleted. Um, And what happens there is uh, your body perceives this rapid increase in energy demand as an emergency, as a fight or flight situation. And it actually mobilizes, it mobilizes uh, lots and lots of glycogen. So it's been shown that these two 20 second sprints mobilize about 25 to 30 percent of the glycogen stores in your in your quads in your glutes 
in these big muscle groups. Now that's an awful lot of energy. That's mm -hmm. really like you could run a lot of time on that um, amount of energy and you'd burn actually just a, a small fraction of that. But the adaptation, the adaptation is already uh, caused by the mobilization because um, bound to glycogen and, and then uh, released and activated um, are certain signaling molecules. So this specifically is AMPK that's bound to the glycogen. You mobilize it, it gets released and activated. And then downstream, uh, further downstream, uh, activates another signaling molecule, PGC1-alpha, mm -hmm. which, which uh, is the master regulator for mitochondrial biogenesis. Um, and that basically tells, like on a, on a chemical biological level, your body that it has to get fitter and stronger and it has to get better at utilizing um, oxygen. And the release of these molecules is achieved through the, the, the glycogen depletion, the glycogen mobilization that, that happens with those two 20 second sprints. And the crazy thing is that, um, like usually in exercise, um, generally more is better. Like if yeah. you, if you work out longer, you get greater benefits. Mm -hmm. Or if you work out at a higher intensity, you get greater benefits. Now, with rehit, that relationship seems to be um, just it doesn't seem to apply. So um, when we look at doing longer sprints, so not twenty second sprints, but like thirty second sprints or forty second sprints, or doing more sprints. Mm -hmm. It appears so. The current understanding of the scientific community is that there's not greater benefit from that, and in fact, it's other way around that you get less benefits if you did longer sprints or more sprints. Now, that's 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 pretty hard to understand, and um, the, the the no nobody understands this completely. Yeah, mm -hmm. but the mm -hmm. the what is thought to happen is that if you do if you know you have to do say six 30 second sprints or so yeah that you actually pace yourself you Natural, don't out go, of my instinct yeah yeah you don't yeah, yeah. because you know you have to do this six times so you better take it a little bit easier and leave <laughs> some left in the tank yeah yeah um whereas if you do two 20 second sprints you can actually push to your limit in that very short period of time and and it is that pushing to your limit and having the 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 rapid kind of this instant, very high spike in energy demand that triggers the, the glycogen mobilization, glycogen depletion, and the release of those signaling molecules. And if you, if you knew you had to do more sprints, longer sprints, you'd hold back yeah. and, and pace yourself and thereby basically undermine that adaptation pathway. Mm -hmm. Now, that is, that is what the scientists we work with Belief and hypothesize. No, nobody's like it's really difficult to to prove that. that um, right. So be that it's in, not that mental. That yeah, mental yeah, yeah, switch. exactly. Well, and you know what's interesting about the two, two sprints is that the second one, I'm I would guess it. This is the case for many people. The second one is often more powerful than the first one. As much as we might think that the first one mm -hmm. will exhaust you, I find that my second one usually my peak power goes up and I'm my second line. It, like I don't decline nice, as, nice. as, as steeply as the first one, so, not so much, I, but <laughs> I, I, I have to admit it's, it's the other way around for me. So for me is the, the first one is always well, maybe uh, I don't a little push bit as better. Hard the first one. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> no, you do you so I, I, I'm sure um, that that's okay. That's okay. Uh, but I, so I, I, at least I don't know whether there's a general rule for that okay, yet. And, and, kind of in our little n equals two example here um we, we don't have conclusive yeah well <laughs> i, I always this, equated yes. it to mm. um like when i you know when you're training to do pull-ups in a gym um the times i got pull-ups were the times where i would start by doing you know an extra like hanging from the bar and scapular retractions then mm -hmm. i would do assisted pull-ups with a band I would get rid of the band and then I would do the pull up. And what I would have essentially been doing is priming my nervous system and mm -hmm. almost waking up the muscles and engaging them so that they were now ready 
Yeah. To perform I mean, the one thing, compound exercise. So you, you don't have to, um, like the, the workout has a very short warm up, two yeah. minute warm up, very, very light, and you can um, Super easy. shortcut it. Um, uh, significantly further you can keep it as short as 20 seconds because the the warm up in itself doesn't actually add so much mm -hmm. to the to the exercise however one thing i've noticed for myself is if i've done other workouts beforehand so if i've done lighter longer workouts beforehand and uh, come to it warm i i do get better um like peak power i do get better scores um, because my system is is that little bit more prepped. So, yeah. um, but I don't think that um, adds more to the effectiveness. This is just um, you know if you if you are keen on your position in the leaderboard, and uh, I am, many others are, um, that that might help a little bit as well. Yeah, a hundred percent. So we were talking before the podcast. You were saying there's this one workout that women seem to like a lot. And I think it's all in the title um, and maybe yes. the fact that women are slightly more masochistic than men. <laughs> so yeah. sometimes so, um, that, and, and that is the, the fat burner. So, you yeah. know, so many yes. women like our obsession is I got to drop the fat. I got to burn the fat. I got to get rid of mm -hmm. the fat. I need to lean out. And so you see fat burner and you're like, Ooh, what's that? And I know that was my reaction because nobody told me about it. And I went, What's that? And I got schooled on what the yeah. fat burner exercise yeah, yeah. workout so, was. So I shall say a few things before we go to that particular workout. So I, we believe very clearly that um, rehead and car the Carol bike is a very useful tool yeah. for weight management. And and I and certainly I have my own experience in that that I've lost uh, quite a lot, something like twenty pounds, um, with with very little effort um, when I started doing these workouts. Um, and I, I think I attribute that to the improvement in, in insulin sensitivity mm -hmm. and, and um, my ability to basically access well, my fat stores and energy that I, that I carry around with me. And so even if I do intermittent fasting or longer fasts, I actually don't feel all that terribly hungry because I have energy and I have access to my yeah. energy sources. So I think it's, it's, that's really... Um, that's, that's one big contributor that makes weight management easier. The other thing is, um, so also on the two twenty second sprint ride, you, you have actually a phenomenal amount of afterburn epoch, excess yes. post exercise oxygen consumption. So even though the, the exercise is so short and you, you actually burn quite little energy during the exercise for the next 90 to 180 minutes afterwards, your, your metabolism operates at an elevated level. And so about two thirds of the overall calorie consumption um, comes from the afterburn. And mm -hmm. so when I do one of those rehead sprints, I burn around, so, so during and after the workout, around 220 calories, that's about 10% of my baseline calorie demand. That's, that's meaningful. So it's just, um, it helps in that equation as to... Uh, you know, not everybody believes in calories in, calories out, but it, it's, it can't harm if it's if it helps well, and for it's, that. And it's the I think it's what you said earlier. It's the it's the body's ability now to access stored energy, yeah. right? Yes. You're reestablishing these and maybe reestablishing a little bit more metabolic flexibility, so that yes, the body yes, can go exactly that isn't always looking for an external source of energy. It's like right, yeah. we've got a buffet on board here. If we need it, we can go. Yes, exactly that. <laughs> exactly that. Um, so, so that's that's a little bit of intro for um, uh, on on weight management. And the other thing I should say is, many people view exercise as a means to lose weight, and that's that's really is is almost getting your priorities wrong because mm -hmm. cardiorespiratory fitness in terms of health and longevity is so much more important than. Um, your weight. So definitely in terms of these excess deaths, as I said earlier, um, ca low cardiorespiratory fitness is way more, um, mm, is way worse in terms of uh, mortality than obesity in itself. But nevertheless, it's it's um, important to many and I don't blame anybody. It's very, very understandable. Um, so uh, yes, we, we have the bike has multiple workouts. We have at the moment, I think, 21, and you can use it with uh, a bunch of third-party apps as well. So it's a very, very versatile bike. 
Um, but we have um, this this uh, series called the Fat Burn series, which um, has slightly less intense uh, uh, sprints and shorter sprints. So it's eight second sprints with a 12 second break. Um, and you do 30, 45, or 60 of them, depending on how hardcore you are. Mm -hmm. uh, and you will sweat buckets. And the calorie burn is absolutely phenomenal. Mm -hmm. So so the amount of calories you burn through through those rides is, is off the charts. Um, and there, one thing, which is a, a slightly curious thing, we, we do see that's the one workout that, that our female users seem to be doing more than our men. So we, we're quite balanced in terms of uh, who, who buys our bikes and who's using our bikes. It's pretty much 50-50 men and women. So it's not at all something that's only for men or only for women, not at all. Yeah. But the fat burn series, that's like one noticeable difference that seems to be done more by women. And I, you, I leave you to speculate why that is, but it, I, I guess it yeah. is because they're the 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 objectives and desires are, are just slightly right. mismatched or, or well, different it, it, between you know, the male. Yeah, I think if you think about it, women are and and I mean these are gross generalizations, just to be clear. Mm -hmm. But in general, women are obsessed with getting losing fat, and men are obsessed with building muscle. And so, at the end of the day. The, really, we want to be in the middle. We want mm. both. We want to build muscle and lose fat. But yeah, if absolutely. you look from a from a gender generalization perspective, the female obsession is fat burning. Mm. The male obsession tends to be bulking up and building muscle. Mm. And so, and you know, yeah, I, at least I, I recognize mean, that very for myself. Girl, and and I mean, people go through different phases. I had um, so a few years back. I and in fact, I, I lost quite a substantial amount of weight with. Uh, kind of in parallel to to using the bike um with fasting and uh some other things and and i certainly my focus shifted uh, away from that um, i'm much less concerned about weight and actually um i just want to be as fit as possible and and as strong as possible so that's mm -hmm. um and then the third thing is uh, also, like I, I added now, stretching routines into my so so I do I do Carol for my um, and rehit for my cardiorespiratory fitness and that works really well and I've um, so we're we're just introducing now this will be launched very shortly a, a VO two max test where you nice. get the um, where you can measure your VO two max uh, and and get it against refer like general reference tables scientific reference tables so I I know that I'm pretty good on that one. Um, I, I love weightlifting for, mm -hmm. for strength. And then, uh, like I, I do, I have to say, so I'm now 46 and, and found that, that mobility and, and stretching is just another component that's actually really important. So I do those three things in terms of, uh, workouts and, mm -hmm. uh, it needn't take a lot of time. So these, you can actually, as you said, you can achieve an awful lot with very little, but mm -hmm. those are the things that, that I prioritize and certainly, um yeah just weight is no no longer kind of a prime consideration for me it's just i want to be fit and i want to be strong and functional yeah and i mean look you're a pretty lean guy i mean at the end of the day you know when you're talking to someone who's carrying mm. around a lot of extra weight yeah, there's, sure. there's the you know there's the physical discomfort there's the fatigue that comes with that there's the inflammation that comes with it so yeah. there's yeah. a big argument in that sense for a, a person who's carrying around an uncomfortable amount of extra weight mm -hmm. that that shedding some of that weight is going to benefit them Absolutely. both in how yeah. they feel, how they perform, and frankly, even in their their biometrics, right? Their inflammation is yeah. going to go down. All the things. I think one of the things you said earlier is you know was alluding to you can't exercise off a bad diet, um, yeah. but I do mm -hmm. think that interestingly enough, with with this type of rehit workout, you might be able to offset some of the some of the some of the downsides of, of a crappy mm. diet it's not going to do all the work for you it's not going to offset a steady diet yeah. of french fries and deep fried burgers and cheeseburgers yeah. and whatnot yeah. Yeah. but sure. i also think that when and i've seen this in my own clients when people start to see that they're winning and and the cool thing about rehit is you can see those benefits and maybe mm. in a very short period of time people can build success on top of success. And when oh, you start absolutely. to get that little yeah. toe hold and you're like, oh my God, like I'm feeling better. I lost a little bit or my blood work's looking a bit better. 
it gives people, okay, I can do this. And they're ready to take the next step and the next yes. step. And it mm-hmm. becomes, it becomes a, yeah, a almost like an entry drug. And so no, that's certainly something I, I hear from our users and to an extent, that's also my personal story then because I, uh, so, so as a, you know, teenager or, or in my early twenties, I, I did sport for competitive reason and for fun, yeah, to compete. That that was uh, what what I was into. But then in my in my thirties, to be honest, I couldn't have cared less. Um, <laughs> like there were so many. There, there were like like my job, children, and and health hadn't become a concern yet. Yeah. You know? sure. um, and and then inching towards forty. Um, I started with rehit as an entry entry drug, if you if you will, and then um, added weightlifting and added some more running and added um, stretching and uh, all sorts of other silly things or, or good things, yeah, like cold showers and stuff like that. Yeah, um, all the things. yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. So so it certainly for me was an entry drug into into this world of biohacking, self-optimization, and just looking after myself in a, in a kind of pretty aware and self-conscious way and, yeah. and trying to, you know, be, be the best and most functional version of myself. Yeah, no, that's, I mean, I think your, your story is very common. And I think that, you know, from a, from a health and longevity perspective, and that's where if we're, you know, if we have these objectives, we want to look good, we want to feel good, we want to perform mm-hmm. well, we want to move through our days with ease so that we feel comfortable. And then you've you've hit the three pillars of fitness, right? You the mm-hmm. mobility, the cardio, the strength. You've kind of yeah. hit those marks. But to be able to do it with diminished risks of injury, diminished risks of, you know too much cortisol, which, you yeah. know, is an issue. Like my husband does these crazy swim workouts with a master's club, a couple of three, mm-hmm. da- three days a week, two nights. And the two nights he does those workouts, he basically doesn't sleep. He lies in bed and twitches all night oh. long because his cortisol has been jacked so yeah. high yeah. that his nervous system just can't shut down. So mm-hmm. I would argue that, you know, I mean, I kind of pushed him back into the pool when he needed hip surgery, which is what helped him to yeah, stay fit yeah. until that happened. But I'd be now we're getting to a point where it's becoming an, yeah. a, a diminishing returns. The problem is he loves it and and it gives mm-hmm. him, he gets something out yeah. of it, right? But, um, but, but when we're talking about exercise as a tool for longevity and health span, I think that's where we have to start to get into this, this more technical area and, and rethink our beliefs that we have to exercise long and hard Mm. five days a week. You know, like I gave up on CrossFit as a longevity strategy a long time because I got tired of funding my chiropractor's kids university education, for example, Uh because I was constantly broken. And, and you could say, Oh, Nat, you probably were doing stuff wrong, but you know what? I think that even if you look at professional CrossFit athletes, one mm-hmm. of their main obsessions is how do I heal from injury fast enough to get to the next competition? So so when we're thinking about exercise as a tool, to your point, right? Yeah. As a yeah. tool to meet our longer term objectives, it behooves us to start to rethink those that framework that we that those beliefs that we have around exercise and consider that maybe less is more and yeah, doing exactly. More, better less, right? So mm. that doesn't mean walking 10 minutes is going to be better. But if you can find a way to trigger these chemical cascades in the body, like the AMPK, the PG1-alpha, mm. all of these things, in in even a short period of time, yeah. the, the returns are astronomically higher than yeah. almost anything else you could do. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like they, like I, I would struggle to find anything that has quite the same level of return on the time you invest, on the effort, on the pain, um, then we hit. So it's it's uh, in terms of uh, return of investment, phenomenally rewarding. Yeah, yeah, a hundred percent. And I think you know, as we wrap up here, I think the accessibility of it is also really important, right? So, I I have a girlfriend who has the bike, and in her family, there's a twenty one year old who's obsessed with fitness. 
her husband, who's pushing 60, obsessed with cardiovascular, that kind of stuff. She herself had to have a stent put in because she had a cardiac blockage. So you, and hasn't worked out in hadn't worked out in years, mm. right? She just didn't exercise. So you have three people across the spectrum, right? Yeah. You've got the young guy who's really fit, who does all kinds of workouts. You've got the dad who's a busy lawyer, who's, you know, but becoming obsessed with this whole longevity game. And then you have her who's been essentially sedentary, but has had a major wake up call. And all yeah. three of them use their bike. They use mm. them, com- awesome. they use it mm. completely differently. Yeah. but they all use it. And I fi- I feel like there's not that many tools that we have where we can engage, you know, across generations yeah. and desires and goals. So, and, and that's right. And we've, we've put a lot of effort into creating that um, versatility. And so um, maybe just to explain that briefly for your listeners, um, the, the bike is totally optimized for rehit and for structured workout sprint interval training. So that is what we what we major on and where we can do things that nobody else can do. Mm-hmm. On the other hand, obviously you can use it like a normal bike, but you can also use it with quite a range of um, third-party apps. So, so if you wish, if you're so inclined to do, you can use it with Peloton Digital and do group classes. Or if you want, if you so there's there's a whole subculture um, of of um, you know people who have a road bike and their lycra suit and who want to um, then indoor cycle on apps like Swift or KinoMap or Ruby and so on, and we're fully compatible with those two. So while we're like an ultra specialized bike. Um, we, we are also a very versatile bike. Mm-hmm. And the, the reason why we thought that's important is that most people don't have two bikes at home. Most people have just one bike in a household and it needs to cater for different people. And in certainly in my house, we have, um, so I've got two 14 year olds who, who use it. Um, they, they do the rehit workouts, but they also use it with Swift and um, cycle kind of do virtual races against their friends uh, who, who have similar equipment at home. And and my wife has been seen on it um, uh, with a Peloton seen. digital work <laughs> <laughs> to my, to my uh, misgivings. But yeah, so so that happens as well. So it, it can do all that. Yeah. And so mm-hmm. so it is a quite versatile thing. If you if you only want to do Peloton rides, yeah, by all means you're better off buying a Peloton. And if you only want to do Swift, then you might also be better off to buy a, a Wahoo, whatever, a Wahoo kicker bike or so. There's yeah. there's plenty of choice. But um, if you if you want something that can give you the shortest, most effective workouts, and is versatile to do a bunch of other th- things as well, then I think we we're pretty unbeatable. Yeah, no, I would agree. I mean, we my husband used to put his road bike on a trainer in the winter, and he doesn't do that anymore. He just yeah hops awesome. on the barrel. So, and he does all the things. He does the rehit. He'll do the fat burner. I mean, he's a bit of a glutton for punishment, but he. Uh, <laughs> yes, <laughs> I, I think during the pandemic he may or may not have been spotted doing a couple Peloton rides too. So <laughs> that's all right. That's all right. We don't blame anyone. No, they do that. I, look, it's they they offer a completely different thing. They they offer um, celebrity instructors, um, banging soundtracks, and and you can high five people yeah. on their their leaderboard in real time. That's that's great. And they I I wish them very well. They do their stuff very well. We do. The shortest, most effective workouts, and yeah. we do that exceptionally well. Scientifically validated, science-based, shortest, most effective workouts, and we do we can do other things as well. And we're, we're versatile, but that's what what people, why people get our product. Yeah, well, and you're always adding to it, which is really interesting. Yeah, too, right. Yeah. You're always doing exactly. more research. So, okay, well, I feel like we could keep talking for a while, but maybe this would be a good time to kind of wind it down and tell people how they. I mean, no, there's some great information on your website. All the mm-hmm. research is there. So maybe we could tell people where to find more information about the Carol Bike. And I know that you've created a code for the audience if if they decide this is going to be their investment. Um, I know the code. I don't know if you do, but why don't you tell people where to find you? And then I can give them the code if you don't remember what it is. You've read my face very well there. Thank you so much. <laughs> no, so of course we um, have a special code for your audience. But um, so to to get our bike, it's uh, 
uh, carolbike.com uh, is our web store. Um, you can purchase the bike there. Um, I shall say you, you can find out. So we don't have showrooms. That's just not something we do. You, you can find us in, um, boutique fitness studios and some of the leading biohacking facilities. So all the upgrade labs have Carol bikes or and there's a number of other, you know, biohacking chains that, that have us. Um, but we, we don't do showrooms, mm -hmm. but what we do offer, which is, uh, I think industry leading and, um, very helpful is a 100 day risk-free trial. So when you purchase the bike, you um so you, you purchase the bike and then you have 100 days to see whether it is for you and that is enough time to a see and feel the benefits and also see whether it's something you can stick to mm -hmm. and if it's for any reason not for you we will not squibble will you get a full refund and we pick the bike up that's incredible and that's yes and we can do that because we don't have showrooms um, and because we're confident in our product um, that people love it. Um, so we have this risk-free trial. So if you want to try it, um, uh, probably the easiest way is just to get one and um, and try it for a few weeks yourself. If you don't like it, you can give it back. Most people keep it, so otherwise we wouldn't have a business. Exactly. Um, <laughs> Clearly you're doing something right, otherwise we wouldn't be talking. Exactly that. And and yes, so for, for your listeners, we have a special code that is nat 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 oh that's nat. easy gives NAT. Gives, yeah gives you a hundred dollars off and you still get a hundred days to try it out which is the exactly which is more than three months right so yeah got, exactly you know guys like i mean especially for those of you who haven't been exercising that much go get your labs done get your blood work drawn commit to three times a week for eight weeks and then repeat your blood work see what happens like do your own right. n of one and see see what you can do with with this bike i think it's i think it's pretty amazing but you know we uh we've drunk the kool-aid <laughs> exactly that yes thank you so much even though we don't drink kool-aid because it's horrible for you so thank you so much ulrich this has been a fantastic conversation i've really enjoyed it and um it's always fun to bump into you and to have these chats yeah thank you yeah the pleasure was entirely mine thank you so much